lived in Garden in Flagstaff for almost 30 years. She has her master's in horticulture from Pennsylvania State University. After moving west, Hattie quickly learned that she wasn't in Pennsylvania anymore <laughs> and signed up for the Coconino Master Gardener program to learn about both the joys and challenges of gardening in a dry environment. She began coordinating the Coconino Master uh, Gardener for the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in 2003. Hattie has had the good fortune to be able to work with many wonderful Master Gardener volunteers. In 2016, Hattie took the additional role of Director for Coconino Cooperative Extension for the University of Arizona. So, welcome Hattie. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lorette. Master Gardener to be, and Mary, Master Master Gardener. So, and uh, thanks to them for making this happen. So, how many people are gardening in Flagstaff? Or how many people are gardening someplace else? Shout out where you're at. William, California. I know nothing about California. But, but sorry. <laughs> you can leave now. <laughs> no, that's the right thing. I'm a California refugee. You want to go down there? You can go. So, uh, so um, I am going to try to take three and a half. Well, this is soils is a semester long class, and then we teach it in the Master Garden program. It's like three to three and a half hours. I'm going to try to put it into 45 minutes. So um, this is the most important topic for gardening, though it's probably the one that the fewest people come to because they like flowers and fruit and vegetables and all that kind of stuff. But you can't get all that stuff unless you have good soil. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, how many people think they have terrible soil? Yeah. So it, it is really hard, and um, that's why I make fun of Wisconsin, but you know, you just have better soil conditions. We don't have great soil. We have great soil for native plants, but we don't have great soils for um, vegetable gardens or, you know, some perennials, annuals, and non-native um, ornamental shrubs and trees, so that's kind of our challenge. So we're going to talk about how we can figure out, you know, whether you want to grow vegetables or trees or whatever you need to and sometimes it is kind of depressing and so when I do a slideshow I have a whole series of slides I drive around you know different neighborhoods and I take pictures of the you know if they're putting in the house and I go oh those poor people <laughs> I take a picture so it is it can be pretty discouraging but hopefully I'll give you some information that um, can help you a little bit so you know, one of the reasons why we don't have great soils here for non-native plants, and that includes vegetables, is we have a fairly low amount of organic matter. So it's at about 2%. Some people, it could be 0%. There's a couple people that live along the Rio de Flag. There's three or four people, you can be up at about 5%. And so for many vegetables and annuals, you need to have that organic matter. Who came to Frank Brannan's composting talk? Oh, so you all, you just need to add compost to your soil so you can leave now. Because <laughs> that's the solution for whatever kind of soil. And even if you have great soil, you're going to want to add compost. Um, and I know it, um, it, it might be a little warm in here. We were supposed to be outside, but I saw what the winds were supposed to be like. So I said, let's come inside. And if you need to just get up, it's really lovely out there to cool down. Just walk out there and go, and then come back in again. I'm fine with that. So just a little bit about soil horizons. So those are the layers in the soil. And so a lot of us, um, we don't dig down very deep, so we don't really know what's going on down there. But um, first we have grass or weeds, one or the other. And then the next layer will be our layer of organic matter. And underneath the Ponderosa pine forest, you might have pine needle duff, the broken down pine needles, and then you might have a very thin layer of humus, which is not hummus, but it's humus. <laughs> and I think Frank might have told that joke a couple weeks ago. But that's really broken down organic matter, but it's just a little top, small layer like that. And then we have our A layer, and that's what we're gonna work on when we're trying to grow trees and shrubs. At my house, I live in University Highlands. My A layer is about three inches deep. 
If you're in the Sunnyside neighborhood, you might have about 18 inches. If you're in Ponderosa Trails, you might not have any A layer or B layer until you get to the C layer, which is your bedrock, basically. <laughs> so, so you have to dig down and figure out what's going on. And you know, if you bought a property that has already been landscaped, it's likely that somebody brought in a lot of topsoil. Um, and so I did ask somebody from Williams to bring me a soil sample because I thought there could be somebody in, in Williams in the class. And she did, but basically what she brought me, um, she's not here. Okay, good. I'll talk about her. <laughs> so, you know, and this is pretty nice soil, but this is pretty much um, compost and mulch. And so sometimes, you know, root systems don't really grow well in this. They need to grow, you know, 8 to 12 to 18 to 2 feet deep. And so she actually has some pretty good stuff to start with, um, but this isn't really soil. But I'm assuming that Williams has that heavy clay like a lot of people on the um, west side of Flagstaff right there. Mm -hmm. And then people on the east side tend to have a um, cindery soil. In the country club area, it tends to be like a sandy loam. So anyway, the only way you can figure this out is you can dig down and see what you got. And so a lot of us, um, well, I actually went out this morning. I thought, I'm going to bring you a sample of my native soil, right? I couldn't even get the shovel in. <laughs> so it's just a really heavy, heavy clay soil. So you're going to have to figure that out. And if you only have a couple of inches, um, so, um, so that's our A layer. You can dig into the B layer. So um, on the east side of town, it's going to be a lot looser. You probably can go deeper. You might have a deeper soil. On the west side of town, probably all the way to Williams, maybe to Ash Fork. Our B layer is where there's a, an accumulation zone of nutrients and minerals. And it's not bad, but when you are planting a tree or a shrub that needs a deeper root system, you got to dig that up. When I first started teaching the class, I used to bring my pickaxe. Because my pickaxe, the whole tip is bent. <laughs> from swinging it into this heavy, heavy clay. you got to figure out how to break it up. And that's how we garden at my first house. We broke up that clay layer, and that was, oh, wait, if you hire, like, three teenage boys that are really strong and they got a lot of energy and give them, they like to swing those pickaxes, and they don't get so tired, you can break that up. But then you're going to mend that with organic matter. And so you can do it. Sometimes you might hire the landscaper to bring in heavy equipment to do that. Um, so it just depends on your situation, but there isn't like a magic formula. When I moved here, I thought, and this, so I moved here in 93, and I see this bags of gypsum. I never saw bags of gypsum before, and I thought, oh, you sprinkle it on clay soil, right? Magic, it's gonna fix your clay soil. That's what the bag says. Well, that's not what it does. <laughs> so you have to dig up and loosen the soil, and that's, you have to do that. So that's something that you can do. That's your homework assignment. Go and see and dig a hole and then um, get a little depressed, but then go, hmm, well, um, I don't have money to hire a landscaper, but my, neighbor, my neighborhood teens, they're causing trouble. Maybe I can get them to dig these holes for me. So, And some of us get our spouses to do that because I can't swing a pickaxe like I could, you know, almost 30 years ago. And it's like, I hate gardening in Flagstaff. I hate gardening in Flagstaff. I mean, that's really what it was like. And, uh, so I did learn a lot from that. So, um, so that's our horizons. The next thing we want to talk about is soil texture. And that's the amount of sand, silt, and clay that's in your soil. And I'm going to try to do this. And this whiteboard is not great, but so the sand particles are really big, the silt particles are smaller, and the sand particles are clay particles. very small. So I mean clay particles. Sorry, thank you. So sand particles, you can you, you can see with the naked eye anything that's up to about two millimeters. Um, the um, should know all this stuff, but I'll just look because I can't remember. Um, our silk pot particles are between 0.05 and 0.002 millimeters, so you can't really see those. And the clay particles, you can see the clay particles because they're really small because they're clumped together in a big clump. And uh, so you need to know what 
your combination is. And one of the ways you can do that is to take, do a jar test. And that's what this is. This has been sitting for about two years. I can't take the lid off because it's going to smell really, really horrible. But what you need to do is um, take one of your kitchen um, tools. So half of my kitchen tools end up as gardening tools. Um, but uh, I used to have a soil sieve. I can't find it. So I use my uh, colander because the holes in this are, um, uh, they are, point or they're two millimeters in size so I need to screen out all the rocks and all the twigs and big hunks of organic matter so I have like a fine um, soil and this this soil is from the Dony Park area and so I just screened it just now and so if you can get about a cup of that stuff you can put it in a mason jar they're nice because they have nice straight lines and then you're gonna put about a cup in there and fill it up with water and then you're going to try to find somebody that uses powdered dishwasher detergent and not those little pods. So, but you need to add about two tablespoons of dishwashing detergent. It's low suds, that's why we're using that. And then you're going to put it all together and find somebody that needs some occupational therapy or some arm strength and shake it for 10 minutes. And so it, you really do have to shake it because you want to break up anything like any clay particles that are at two millimeters you want to break them up because you want to know how much sand silt and clay and if you let that settle you'll see layers now this one i couldn't actually shake up shake up because it's been sitting for too long but then you know i marked on here where i saw the layers and we have ours usually are really dark if you did this from your soil from wisconsin usually you can see the layers a lot more clearly um, but what you do is put it on a sunny, like maybe on your kitchen window where there's a lot of sun so you can see the layers. And the sand's gonna settle out first, okay? And so I put a little line where the sand settled out. So I said 1.75 inches. And then the silt layer will settle out. It takes about two minutes for the sand layer to settle out. Two to three hours for the silt layer to say to settle out. And then about two to three days for the clay layer to settle out because it's hung up in suspension in the water. That'll give you a really good estimate of what you have. So you add all that stuff together. And so this is about three inches, more or less. It's about half sand, about 15% silt, and about 35% clay. So that, um, there are worse sands, but that is gonna be more like a clay. Clay is good but more than 40% clay is bad. I had a group of master gardeners that made a series of figurines out of their clay soil for me. <laughs> so, um, and so whether you have too much sand or too much clay, the solution is to add organic matter. Because if you add organic matter um, in a sandy soil, the water won't drain through as fast, it will hang on to more nutrients, and if you add organic matter to a clay soil, it will help the water drain a little bit better. Um, and um, so you don't just, you know, when you water a clay soil, you water and the water all goes this direction and never goes down where the roots are. So that's something that you can do um, at home. Um, and you really, you really can't uh, see this clay particles very well, but you can feel like silk particles. And I'm just gonna tell you what my, um, I was gonna draw this chart, but there are these soil texture triangles, you can see them on the internet, but a soil that has 50% sand, 15% um, silt, it's, I can't read it. Um, it's like a clay, well, it's dark. So it's like a clay loam. And so that's the kind of soil that I have at my house. And so, add organic matter and breaking it up. And then that's when using a product like, you know, a soil amendment that might have gypsum can help keep those layers from, you know, becoming compacted. So um, I do have a couple soil samples here where we're gonna talk about structure. And I'll show you those in just a minute. My lovely assistants will pass these around. So this morning, I dug these out of my garden, okay? And I want you to, Pretty, isn't it? So they're going to just pass those around so you can see them. Yeah. 
just don't trip on the cord because I there's my vinegar right there. So a lot of our soils don't have very good structure because we had a house put on the property and somebody drove around with a lot of equipment and compacted all that soil. And, and so our soil, a good soil needs to have about 50% mineral soil and then 50% air pockets for water and or 50% pores so you can have quarter water and a quarter air because roots need air. So if it's really compacted, those roots don't get enough air or if you have a tree that's growing and you decide to put a patio on top and you compact that soil, that tree often will die because the roots can't get any oxygen. So except for that pine tree that might send its roots about 50 to 100 feet that direction. And you go, well, you said it was gonna die, Hattie, and it didn't, but you know, we don't know where the roots are, but um, we can kind of estimate. Um, but anyway, with our, with our, um, I said surface here. This is supposed to say structure. Sorry about that. We'll survive. Yeah, structure. Yeah, but we're being tamed. Oh, structure. <laughs> So the way to break up structure is to hire those kids with pickaxes. So you have to physically break it up. I thought I could buy the gypsum and just sprinkle it around and it was gonna just break everything up. And that's really not what happens. You have to physically break it up. If you think you can't, that's when you have to start thinking about making raised beds. Now this garden soil that's going around, that's my vegetable garden. So for my vegetable garden, we went down about um, 12 inches, so we got into that heavy V layer. We had to break that up, but then we also went up 12 inches. So we have 24 inches of soil to work on. I've been in this house for 20 years. It's taken 20 years to get soil like that, where I don't even need a shovel anymore. But then I was, okay, I'm gonna get, I wanna do a comparison. And, um, and there's our win. That's why we're in here today. So, uh, <laughs> If, um, you know, that if unamended soil, I could not get, well, of course it's really dry out too, so that's the other reason. So if you have to dig into that B layer, you're gonna have to wet it before you can ever get your tools into it. And that's kind of a trick that we do. I start building, making a hole, I get it about this big, and then I put water in it, and then I come back the next day and I start digging some more, and then I put more water in it. And that's actually how I do dig when I'm just putting one plant in, I don't want to mend everything, I just want to mend this area. So it takes a little while, um, and I do use a pickaxe to do that, and I use a lot of custards too. So that's, that is a challenge. But um, a good soil will have these clods that you see in this um, soil that's being passed around. It has a great color. We haven't added any organic matter yet, so that's what the soil was like um, this morning. My husband's probably going to put organic matter in it today. Um, he's just got the itch, and I said, you know, it's going to be really cold next week, but he's going to put peas in. I did, um, this is a talk about soils. So I did actually go out and take the soil temperature um, this morning. Woo! It says it's 90 degrees in here. I'm sorry, but remember, you can walk outside, cool off, and come back in. What do you think the soil temperature is right now? 50. It's 50. Did you measure yours? No. <laughs> That's usually what it is the first or second week in, in um, April. And, and Jim Mask will be here next week. He'll talk about this. But a lot of seeds don't like to germinate at 50 degrees. Um, they like to be at about 60 or 70. So, um, but peas, that's fine with them. And some of the leafy greens, it's fine with them. So, um, this is just a little handy thing to have. Thank you. Um, so if you're thinking about planting, now if you're, if you're planting a tree or a shrub, it's not gonna be that important because you know it's not gonna grow a lot of roots at 50 degrees, um, but you can still plant it. So it's just really when you're putting seeds into your garden. Okay, so um, the other thing we need to talk about is, oh wait, let me show you this first. So we're still talking about structure. Daddy, what? Yes. Hi. Did you mean to say that we could plant a plum tree now? <coughs> yes. Yes. Dig it up and move it and plant it. 
If you are digging up a tree to move it, I would wait till the monsoons because you're going to kill half the roots and then it's going to not have that whole root system. When is monsoon? In July. Fingers crossed. Right? <laughs> That's the best time to transplant big trees and shrubs. And it's because you're going to damage the root system and then you move it and it's going to, right now they're budding out. They're thinking about, some of them are flowering already. And so it's putting resources into putting out flowers and leaves, but it doesn't have a whole root system. And so that's usually a recipe for death, unfortunately. So little they are, if they're tiny, it's easier, but if they're big, it's better to wait. And I know that's really hard. So it matters how wide, the, how, what the diameter of the tree trunk is. So, so I brought this in because our office is off of um, Ford Street next to Killip Elementary School. Does anybody recognize this? That's all that silt that came off the mountain that flooded our parking lot. I almost lost my car. I mean, really. Um, it was, I mean, I'm standing there watching the water and there's my car and I can't even get to my car to move it. So, uh, but my car's fine. But um, anyway, I got this. So this is something that Oh, look, there's, it's a clump, and I just picked this up yesterday from the office. I did do a jar test, I didn't bring it with me, but it is 100% silt, so that's all that stuff that came off the mountain. Um, one of the county folks, we have a giant pile in our, in our, um, next to our parking lot. If you would like some silt, you're welcome to come get it. But one of the county guys said, you know, you're master gardeners, why don't you get master gardeners to take that stuff? And I go, I am not wishing this on any master gardener because um, it just crumbles just like that. So it doesn't have any structure at all. But um, yeah, there's no, they just need to haul it away. I don't know what else you could do for it, but I mean, it just, you know, sand, so with sand, I wouldn't be able to hold it like this. Clay I can, but clay's not going to crumble like that. Clay, you're going to be like, wait, you know, um, so that is 100% silk, silk, and it doesn't have a very great color. There is an organic matter in it. Well, actually there is now because we have lots of weeds growing in it. Um, so, so I need to figure out what to do with that stuff. So anyway, you can look at your soil structure, um, and probably if it's an area next to your house, you're going to need to break it up. And this is probably between not having enough soil and the structure, that's when you sometimes hire somebody to help you out a little bit. And I have hired people, you know, when I've done bigger projects where it's just not practical for me to amend a whole area swinging a pickaxe. So, um, um, and then another thing about texture, you can change the soil structure by adding organic matter. You'll never be able to change that texture, that ratio of sand, silt to clay, unless you bring in truckloads of topsoil, which is gonna be all cinders. So that's the bad part. But that's what we have for topsoil around here. That's, you know, and so you'll add organic matter, right? That's the solution to everything. So I, when I first moved here, the first like year I was here, I was at a party, you know, people say, oh, you're a gardener. They tell you gardening stories and stuff. And this guy said he had brought in seven truckloads of topsoil. And I went, what am I drinking? You bring in topsoil by the truckload? So, it, he, you can't change the ratio of sand, silt, and clay, but you can if you bring in something else by the truckload. And so sometimes that's what you have to do because you have such a bad situation. And I have seen gardens where people have dug down for three feet, took it all out, and then brought something else in. And they, it looks like a garden out of Sunset Magazine. The difference, I know compost is sort of is organic matter mulch is something different. What purpose does mulch serve? So mulch is for the top of the soil. And so it's a little confusing when you look at soil amendments. So you can have, you can make compost is the best, but you know, if you're putting in native plants, maybe you don't want something as rich as um, topsoil. So maybe you'll use maybe a bark mulch soil amendment because it's not going to be super rich. Um, but the mulch really, you know, it can be dug in, but really mulch should just be on the top two or three layers. And it could be organic, 
like bark mulch, or it could be a rocky mulch. Um, so it depends, you know, what you, you know, what look you like. Uh, I wasn't aware that the friend told me that like a raw woody cutter absorbs nitrogen out of the soil. No, yeah, it is true. Not if it's a mulch on top. Okay. So if you have a lot of big woody stuff, put it in your compost bin, compost it a while. But if you would dig a lot of wood chips into your soil, oh, I got this free load of organic matter. She said dig stuff into the garden and you dug in wood chips, it would rob your soil of nitrogen because the microorganisms need to use that nitrogen um, to eat because they're using the carbon and they need to have that balance of carbon to nitrogen. If that's what you got, if that's all you got, add nitrogen. So you can add blood meal. And then all the dogs in the neighborhood will dig up your dog. Oh wait, add blood meal, have them come dig, and then they can do the soil tilling for you. I, I gotta make a video of that. So, so I have to, you know, I made a joke, but I have this big dog, and uh, Mary got to meet her the other day, and one time she was furiously digging and digging and digging after these pocket gophers that finally showed up, and how did they get there when I have like the heaviest, thickest soil? But I'm watching her do this, and I go, wow, look, like three minutes, she's dug down about that far, she's loosened up all the soil. So one of my favorite gardening tools now is one of those three-prong digger tools, and I dig like this, just like a dog would. And that's actually how I loosen up that, that bee layer sometimes from my, from my dog. And, you know, and then when the pocket gophers show up, you know, my dog just goes, hi, you know, and then she goes away. So she doesn't even chase them. But um, yeah, it is the saddest thing in the world. You go, you plant six broccoli plants, and then you go out the next day and you only see five, and you go, I'm pretty sure I planted six, but no, oh, whatever. And then the next day you go out and there's only four, and you go, well, something's wrong. We didn't have pocket gophers for years. We got them three years ago. And then the next time you're out there and you just see the plant go, and it's like, dang it, you know. <laughs> so that's, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> so. Okay, so pH. So most of the soil um, in Arizona is alkaline. So it has a pH that's higher than seven. In Flagstaff, the average is about 7.2. West of town, you can maybe be about 6.8, so slightly acidic. East of town, 7.3 to 7.5. Going out Townsend Winona Road, you can get to 7.5 to 8. So it depends where you live. Um, and it's a little hard. I will talk about soil testing in a bit. But anyway, it really helps if you can figure out what your soil pH is. But for most people in town, that's the least of our worries. The least, our biggest worry is that we don't have any soil, right? We have rocks. Um, but that's something that can be tested, and I, I will talk about that. And, um, but for vegetable gardens, um, you know, the favorite is um, pH is about 6.5. And Jim will talk about, if you're coming next week, he'll talk about this, but just in case, you know, the product that you can add to help, if you're up above seven, especially on the east side of town, add a little soil sulfur, because that will bring the pH down a little bit. And it's a little bit more complicated um, than that, but the, if you would see a bag of soil sulfur, I think they, I didn't look to see if they have it here, um, but it tells you what to, how to add it. I'm yes. Sure. Soil what? Sulfur. Oh. Sulfur, yeah. So um, if you want to grow blueberries, so you have to go from your soil pH is 7.2 to 4.2. If you add enough sulfur to get your soil pH that low, you're going to have sulfur toxicity. You can't do it. Um, so I do have these lovely assistants. Uh, so anyway, but that's a way you can help adjust your soil, particularly for vegetables, because they like to be at 6.5. That's when most of the nutrients are available. Um, and that's one of the ways you can help them. I'm gonna use this soil right here. So if you have a jug of, did it, whoops. Can somebody hand me my jug of vinegar, please? <laughs> so if you, um, and Mary and Lorette are gonna let you carry this around. So if you have vinegar, you can get your soil and put some vinegar in it. Ooh, that one's really foaming up. <laughs> so it's gonna bubble like an Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
What does that mean? What does an alkyl seltzer do? Binds acid and base. Yeah, it buffers. It's a buffer. So many of our soils have this buffering capacity in them because we have, um, I can't remember the, new, the chemical that it has, but we have this. Almost all of our soils have that. But the more it bubbles, the indication that it's going to be alkaline. So if you have a clay soil, it's not going to bubble very much. But this is really bubbly. This is from the Doney Park area. And so that's just a little quick test that you can do um, and just kind of see. It's, it's kind of like a gee whiz thing, too. It's like, wow, look at that. So when we try to adjust our soil pH, that buffering capacity is fighting us when we're trying to lower it. Now, a little bit of soil sulfur we can get the pH down to 6.5, but we're never going to get it down to 5 or 4.5 to grow blueberries, ever. And many master gardeners have tried to grow blueberries unsuccessfully, including yours truly. Even with the five growth pines, like say my daughter's full of five growth pines, they won't grow in there? The blueberries? No, so she asked about ponderosa pines. Ponderosa pines don't change our soil pH. Eastern part of the United States, if you're growing under pine trees, your soil is going to be at about a pH of 5. But we don't have enough moisture. They don't break down fast enough. So have I discouraged everybody from ever trying to garden. Thanks, Mary. Um, yes, but the key to having, so you got, she said we got this buffering capacity, you know, and if you buy topsoil, you're definitely going to have something that's got a higher pH because if it's going to be coming from Doney Park, it's going to be screened stuff. It's kind of, and I purchased it. But you can add organic matter. That's the solution to everything. Now, if you add 18 inches of organic matter, that might be a little bit too much. So I still always like to have a mineral soil component, even when I'm making a raised bed. And what I like to do when I've had to make raised beds, which I have many times because I have such terrible soil, is I like to say about a third part mineral soil a third part compost or organic matter, and a third part potting soil. And I'm sorry, Warners, I've just saved you a little money because it doesn't have to be all potting soil, right? But you're going to have a lot more success because you have that mineral component in there. And um, I have certainly, you know, gardened in potting soil year after year after year, but after a couple years, it's just kind of worn out. And I'll add Osmocode, which is a slow release fertilizer, but having that mineral component is what really can help, um, you know, help you have a, a better raised bed for the future. So, yes? I've got some potty soil in pots that I need to take out and replenish because they've grown like tomato plants for several years. Mm -hmm. Can I put that in the garden? Um, yes, except, so she asked about potting soil that you planted tomatoes in. You can, but you're going to put that in an area that you don't plan to put tomatoes in. Okay. Yeah. Because or potatoes disease. because of disease. You know, and then, I mean, you can plan in there about three years from now. So, mm -hmm. um, so it, it's possible it has a disease in it. It might not, but it'll be a drag if you do all that work. When I was at Penn State, before I discovered, I used to work in agronomy. I grew wheat and barley. I did genetic stuff. And I... I actually hated those crops. I love flowers, so I got my master's degree in greenhouse crops and flowers. But you know, I had two miserable years of looking at wheat, <laughs> walking in the fields. But we grew all kinds of stuff in the greenhouse because we would cross A with B and try to see if they were just looking for disease resistance. Classic plant breeding. But we took all that potting soil home because it was just wheat and put it into our gardens. And we had the most beautiful garden. Um, because it was half potting soil. So, uh, but uh, we compost our potting soil sometimes, or we also have a big bin that we just dump it in and let it kind of sit for a year or two, and then we'll reuse it because it gets to be pretty expensive. Yeah. Um, so that is one trick that you can do. If I'm not growing, if I'm just growing flowers, sometimes I'll take out half the potting soil, add some more potting soil, and add some Osmocote, you know, just to kind of save some money. So if it's just containers, I don't usually put mineral soil in a container. Um, so anyway, so pH, um, it is something to think about. And um, I think the last thing we'll talk about is soil testing. 
So every gardening book that you read says, call your county extension office to have your soil <laughs> tested. So I'm sorry, folks. Oh, some of you are from California or Wisconsin. <laughs> We don't have a soil testing lab at the University of Arizona for homeowners. We do have a lab, but that's really for big farmers, and it's unfortunate. Um, but a lot of people ask about soil tests. In general, in general terms, the thing that we're missing most is nitrogen. And Jim will talk about that. I hope you all come to his talk um, when he talks about um, vegetable gardening next week. But um, we usually have enough phosphorus and we usually have enough potassium. So those are the big three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. I've never seen potassium deficiency yet. Phosphorus can be deficient sometimes, particularly on those higher pH alkaline soils, country club area going east. And so sometimes you wanna add a little bit more phosphorus. Sometimes it can't take it up as readily when the soil is cold. Right now it can't, so if you have a a viburnum that's leafing out right now, hopefully it's waiting. Um, if, you, if it's leafing out right now, it might look a little funny, might look a little purplish because it can't get the phosphorus because the soil is cold. Once the soil warms up in a month, it's gonna be fine. So sometimes we do add phosphorus. We do add phosphorus when we're growing bulbs because we want a lot of flowers and things like that. It's usually not, um, you know, a lot of us for vegetable gardening, we'll add something that's like, um, 10 parts nitrogen, 10 parts phosphorus, 10 parts potassium. Or, you know, if you do something organically, you might have three parts nitrogen, four parts phosphorus, two parts potassium, something like um, fish emulsion or something like that. So usually we add that, but it's probably not the limiting factor. It's the nitrogen that's the limiting factor. But when you do a soil test, um, so you can't send it to the University of Arizona, you can't bring me a sample and have me send it down there. Um, every once in a while, if it's a really weird situation, I can talk them into doing the test. Um, so we do have master gardeners that send their samples to Colorado State, and they will do our samples for us, as well as Texas A&M. The other place, the other university that will do our samples, and I don't know about California, I've never looked, because some states won't do your sample if you're not from the state. Massachusetts will too. Um, at Colorado State, we used to use them more frequently. Their price has gone up a lot. Texas A&M, it's $20 for the soil test. And it'll tell you um, per percent organic matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, manganese, and all the other micronutrients. Very rarely are we lit are those the limiting factor. It's usually the nitrogen and the organic matter. But for 20 bucks, it gives you some information. And you'll get the soil pH. And you're gonna get a number called, wow, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's called, it's the electrical conductivity of the soil, okay? So it's how many nutrients can the soil hold? And it's called CEC, but for the life of me, I cannot remember what the C stands for, um, which is really bad. Um, but that's okay, electrical conductivity. So when we use these little home test kits, so this is a little rapid test mini pH tester, and you can get them here, get them all kinds of places. This one can just tell you soil pH, okay? And it's not very accurate but it can give you a ballpark that if you're way off this way or way off that way, it's like, well, maybe I'm gonna spend some money and get my soil tested, right? That's what I think they're really use, useful for. And it could be, if you're downtown in Winona Road, if you're, you know, you could be up at 8% and it's gonna be kind of hard. Um, so that's what that one's really good for. This is another rapid test. And so this is an electronic soil tester. It has a battery. Um, it's been on forever, so I don't know if it's gonna work, but it has a pH analysis and then it has a fertilizer analysis. And that fertilizer analysis is just looking at that electrical conductivity. And that's why you have two of these things. It needs to be a moist soil, you stick it in. It's not gonna work if I stick it into this pile of silt that I have right here. And so it's not super, super accurate, but it's gonna give you a ballpark idea. And that's when you say, maybe I wanna have that my soil tested. I also, I, you know, I used to say, spend your, 
20 or 30 bucks on a compost bin, because you need compost, but um, it does give you some information. And um, somebody had a test kit here. They were gonna ask about a test kit. So, I don't remember, maybe she left me. She's still, okay. Well, there are those little test kits and it's pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and there's a little reagent that you stick in there. And then you, you put your soil in, you put the reagent in, you add a little water, and it will change color and it will give you an idea. That's not super, super accurate, but again, it's a ballpark thing. And I guarantee you, if you do it on native soil for the nitrogen, and I don't happen to have any, I don't have any kits with me right now. Well, actually, no, I didn't bring them, because um, I used up all the reagent, but um, it's purple for nitrogen, and it's always like a really lovely, lovely light lilac color. <laughs> but, but it can give you, a ball, again, a ballpark figure for your soil pH. And then potassium and phosphorus, um, I've only ever seen those come in at you know, either medium or high, so they're usually, usually not a problem. Um, I also, you know, I can do soil test kits in the office, or soil test for pH in the office, and again, this is one where, you know, we add our soil, I'll add a little reagent, I'll add a little, you know, another chemical on top and it'll change color and then I compare it to this chart. And what it's really accurate for, this is seven, where my, the tip of my finger is, down to four. So that's where it's more accurate with the acidic soil. So it doesn't help us a whole lot here. But sometimes we do get blue soils that are up and above eight, so it can help you, give you a little piece of information. Maybe say, oh, this is a good time to put my house on the market. Because <laughs> I know I'll have a buyer tomorrow, right? And, uh, but good luck finding another house. But, um, and then I do have another kit for soil testing right now, but I don't have the reagents for it. Um, and um, that's something that um, hopefully we'll have that available after I um, get the reagents. I had another clipboard around here. We'll find it. There's one with the green paper on it. I don't know what I did with it. Well, she's getting that. Yeah, that's the one. Could you repeat the um, percentages of different types of, of what you like in your soil? A third mineral soil, a third compost, and a third potting soil. Pardon? You mix it all together yeah. for green beds? Yep. Yes. So just to clarify, mineral soil, you just buy that gas, that's fine. That is not mineral soil. That's potting soil. That, even though it says soil, it's not soil. So where do you get the mineral soil? So if you don't have any, you, I, there might be other places now, but I know the Landscape Connection has it, and that's where I've gotten mine from. I think that's where all our landscapers get it from too, but I, I saw a sign, I think there's another person that's trying to sell a product. So that's pretty much screened dirt. And I purchased it because that's all we can get. And you can, you know, I, I had it brought in by the truckload. If you have a truck, um, you can, they'll load it for you. But um, our master gardener, Frank Brandon, he just goes over there every once in a while with the five gallon buckets. And they just, it's really inexpensive that way. It's just that they're heavy <laughs> to pick up. But, you know, if you're making, oh, I'm gonna work on this raised bed today. Maybe you just need three buckets. So it's an easy way to do it. And in his yard, he has small beds like this. And so he works on this bed and then he goes, okay. And then works on that bed. So, you know, you can work on your yard that way. You know, if you can have success in a little space like this, then, then you're gonna be encouraged for the next year. But if you try to do the whole thing and you go, this is really hard. Um, you'll be kind of discouraged and you'll take a very unhealthy habit. Gardening is the best habit in the world, except for your checkbook, right? Excuse me. Yes. Um, I'm now beginning to be confused about the difference between mulch, which is supposed to be on the top, mm -hmm. top soil, and potting soil. Okay. Could you just clarify? Yeah. So mulch is either organic matter, um, or inorganic matter, it could be rocks, or it could be pine needles, bark chips, anything you're putting on the top. When you're buying product, those terms are kind of used haphazardly, you know, and sometimes it's a marketing thing, but you know, something that's on the top, somebody mentioned the nitrogen getting 
tie it up. If you have those bigger wood chips or pine needles, you can use pine needles too because they're free. You can come to my house and rake them. I'll give them I to do. you. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't tie up the nitrogen. It might tie it up for the top like quarter of an inch. So that's the mulch. Sometimes people use soil amendments as mulch, which is okay because it'll eventually get worked into the soil. The worms, you know, if you, I think my worms hit to the bottom, but the worms will come and, you know, it'll kind of break down and, and you can work that into the soil. But usually a soil amendment, it often has fertilizer and um, the bag, what's common now for an organic soil amendment, it has chicken manure, it'll have some bark product, it probably has a little peat moss, it might have, um, they'll say porous product on the bag. So if it's coming out of Phoenix, Grow Well comes out of Phoenix, so it's a lot of the landscape chipping stuff is put in there. It's a pretty good product, but that you work into the soil, okay? So there's no real mineral soil in that. Potting soil is just, um, usually it's, peat moss or cocoa coil, 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 quar, quar, that's right. <laughs> I keep trying to have a word to rhyme it with, quar. So if you're concerned about using peat moss, you can use that. They have big blocks of it right there. It's, you get a block and you put it in a wheelbarrow and you add water and it goes, and expands. Um, that vermiculite, perlite, and if it's organic, it'll have um, some other products for organic fertilizers. All potting soils these days have fertilizer in them. You can't buy a potting soil without fertilizer right now. And it's just because, um, you know, we just all want to just buy a bag and not have to mess with it. Um, so that's something that you can put in a pot. You can certainly just put it into a raised bed and just grow in potting soil. But I just think if you want to, if you have a large bed and you're going to want to have your vegetable garden there and use that bed year after year for different vegetables, you're gonna have more success in the long term if you put some regular, even if it's crappy soil, in that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you're in Wisconsin, <laughs> your topsoil could be that top, you know, three to 12 inches. Um, here, um, you know, I have three inches of the good soil. That's kind of like the A horizon. So, so when you buy topsoil, I don't know what it is. It's screened to a certain size. So you see those big screens, the dump truck will go up and they'll run it through a screen and you'll get a smaller particle on the other side. I don't know if it's sand, silver, clay. It's probably a mixture of, the, of all of those, but when we buy topsoil, it's not like when we're buying topsoil in a lot of other places. So, but it's something to work with. It's still a mineral, it's still a mineral soil. You're still gonna to wanna to add organic matter to it. And that's because we live here. Yes, right here. So last year for the very first time, I put blocks of compost in because I had a lot of now. And I thought, okay, and I didn't do it thick, I did it, I scattered it over the places that all my plants were sitting in me. Yeah. <laughs> soil and so that's you know you don't have to use 
regular, add this minerally stuff, but you're gonna have to keep buying stuff. And so that's, you know, kind of the trade off. Um, and sometimes, you know, I didn't have enough money to do that for a lot of years. That's why I kept reusing stuff. We had a question over here. Uh, I only know of one place, so. <laughs> but it's Landscape Connection. There used to be Fast Fred's, but I don't think he's around anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something to look at because I, I was driving on the east side of town a couple days ago and I saw a sign and I thought, oh, maybe there's somebody that's trying to also sell some product. Because if there's only one guy in town, their price is great though, I think. Um, and you drive in there and you, I want that pile. And they mix their topsoil with actually some composted horse manure that's from the Grand Canyon. That, you know, they really control what those horses and mules eat up there because they don't want any weeds. So that's why it's a pretty good product. Elaine? Yeah, I, honestly, I'm always confused between topsoil and mineral soil. So the topsoil... Well, they're both, they're both the same. That's what I thought, yeah. but then it might be different amounts of mineral soil no, topsoil it is a mineral soil, but the mineral soil could be anything in the soil horizon. The topsoil is usually this much, except in Flagstaff, because I don't know where they're getting their stuff from. So they maybe they dug all the way down when they're putting a house in, and then they just take it and they run it through a screen, through a screen and you get this stuff that has small particle size. So, if we had this conversation in another part of the country, we wouldn't even be talking like this. So that's the challenge with here. So, and I don't know what it is. And so I've always said, if, if the truck shows up and you take a look at what's in the back of the truck and you go, there is no way, take it back, I don't want it. Send it back. Or go and look at it. Go, go there and look at it, put your hand in it and say, yeah, I could work with this. But it doesn't mean that it has a certain percentage of sand, silt, and clay. We don't know where they got it from. But if it's in the Doney Park area, it probably is the topsoil because in Doney Park they have more topsoil. If it's from any place on the west side of town where we only have that much topsoil, it's, they probably went down further. So I was surprised my last batch of landscape connection soil that I had brought in, I was surprised at how much it compacted down. It looked great when they put it in. I don't think it was great. So that's buyer beware. Um, Yes. Um, as I just moved from Wisconsin, I'm trying to adapt now to Flagstaff. This will be my first planting year. And as I dig, I just find layers and layers of the pine needles. And I thought, am I supposed to take all those out, or do I leave them in there and mix everything else with all those needles? So she's obviously living, she, living under pine trees, trying to start a garden. So if you have an area that hasn't been disturbed, um, for a while, you'll have, you know, your soil layer, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have a layer of, of something called duck, and that's the pine needles that have been breaking down for the last 20, 30, 40 years. No fire has gone through there, no, nothing's burned, burned them out. When we first moved here, not having any money, um, only having one old Subaru station wagon, mm -hmm. one inch of garden, my husband's a forestry professor. He's doing a research project where they're scraping away the duck and then putting trees in and leaving the duck. And so all that duck that was scraped off, they brought it to my house. And that was <laughs> organic matter. So that's, you know, it's organic matter. It loosens up a heavy clay soil. It doesn't really have any nutrients in it though. But it was a way to get started. It was free. I got a lot of it. And so we had some pretty nice beds with that. But then, you know, you do have to add fertilizers to something like that because it's just broken down pine needles. Um, they do break down over time. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so just leave them there and just add and mix soil and every organic So I would with say it. if it's really broken down or not. Um, no, they're still whole. No, so that's not, so I would break all those pine needles off. Okay. Put them in your compost pile. They'll compost in two years. It takes a while. Mm -hmm. um, we have five minutes left. I'll take one question and then I'll talk about soil testing and then I can stay and answer questions. How's that? Yes. Uh, okay, so this is Sorry about pointing, but no, that's you with the sunglasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in relation to that, like fire being like taken away from the environment, is 
there a way where like you could potentially put your like coals or um, uh, ash on your garden to like help with like either raising or lowering the pH or like what would you do? So um, usually with ash the the pH is too high, so we don't really want to add a lot of it. Um, I was just at a, a talk yesterday. We have a guy, an extension agent in Gila County, and he's working on biochar, which is kind of like charcoal you can add to the soil. And they're working on how we could add it to our soils, particularly if you have an alkaline soil because it's a little bit alkaline. Um, burning, you know, does a different thing than just adding ashes. Um, and so because we have a buffered soil that's usually alkaline. It's not wise to add ash. You can add some of it to your compost pile, but you're not gonna get all of your last year's ashes from your wood stove. That's too many, or too much, yeah. So, um, yeah, but that's what would take care of like this big pile of duff and, you know, but we don't have that anymore. But you could actually break it up too, so. Soil testing. So, um, there's a website called groworganic.com, and I know the, the little inexpensive tests are like $15, they sell them here. It's great to get a ballpark idea of what your, um, you know, what your soil is, but what I, I like them to do everything, and I am, I was going to do a soil texture test on this one, um, and I'll do that maybe We'll end, and then I can do that if you're still interested, but groworganic.com, that's the website, it's Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. And the reason why I like using them, and I'm, me, Hattie Braun, not the person that's working for University of Arizona Cooperative Extension, because I'm not supposed to like one company over another one, but what I like about that is that it's a, a, an organic, com or a company that believes in organic gardening. And when you send a test, so you'll go to their website and order a test, and it's a little expensive. So for the macronutrients, sulfur, manganese, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, maybe iron, there might be one more, it's 30 bucks. So you go to their website, you order a test, they send you a little bag in the mail. And then you go and dig up a soil sample, not the first three inches, but what you really want your plant roots to grow into. So it could be, I really want to use that soil that's down here. So you're going to have to dig down eight or 12 inches and it's kind of hard. You're going to put that soil in that little bag and you mail it back to them. And then within about a week, um, during COVID, their um, turnaround time was about three weeks, but now they're back up and running. And they give you something like this, that's your soil analysis. And you don't have to have a PhD in soil chemistry to understand this. You don't have to have an extension agent. Um, and this, oh, this is my garden. Oh, soil pH, 6.8, high in nitrogen. Why? Because I added nitrogen. Um, low in sodium. Anyway, you get these kind of charts like this, and then they give you access to this understanding your garden, your soil analysis report. And so if it says, um, and particularly if you're interested, I mean, you, if you're not interested in growing organically, that's fine too, but it's really easy to understand this. If you get a soil test that says, you have 213 parts per million nitrogen in your soil. What does that mean? <laughs> Nothing. But anyway, it'll have these little charts here and then it'll tell you if you have low nitrogen, what you should add. What organic product can you add? If you have a low nitrogen reading, add blood meal. Three pounds per 100 square feet. We can figure that out. It's not, you know, we don't have to do a whole lot of math for that. Or fish meal. So blood meal attracts the dogs, fish meal attracts the cats, <laughs> cottonseed meal doesn't attract anything. But I think if you're concerned about GMO products, I think all cottonseed meal is from cotton plants because they're all GMO, most of them are GMO plants and it's because they have to ward off that um, cotton weevil. Yeah, and so they used to spray every week for 41 weeks, now they don't, they spray once and so that, you know, you know, it's something to think about though, if you're concerned with something like that. So that is a place to go. Um, and then it's, um, I think it's $50 now for the macro and micro analysis. And it does tell you um, the cation exchange capacity. That's the C word that I forgot. So the cations are your nutrients. 
Okay, so your nitrogen, manganese, the ones that have um, a plus on them, if you can remember that. But um, so cation exchange capacity, and so the higher the cation exchange capacity, the higher of the, the more fertilizer your soil can hang on to and make available to the plants. And that's why I think it's a really important number. So that's kind of what this is measuring. Um, it's not super accurate. Here, um, my soil says 32.9 cation exchange capacity. If we did the cation exchange capacity on this really grayish soil, probably it would be about six or 10, so not very good. Add organic matter, because that helps increase your cation exchange capacity. I don't know if that number can be too high or not. Um, so, um, yeah. And then it also has, it says the soil pH. This one has um, percent organic matter. Oh, I remember whose report this is. Um, yeah, it's not mine. 33.5% organic matter. <laughs> so, but um, so this, this person um, was having a problem. And I think she just added too much organic matter over time. So, so it is interesting information. And if you decide to do this, you know, let me know. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, and I'm also curious, you know, what the reports are for different neighborhoods. And I'll just put my email up here. So it's very complicated. H. Braun at Arizona. E. D. U.